what does it mean to see something? For us, on a larger scale, it's the light bouncing from the object to our eyes, and our brain produces a visualization of the object. However, when we want to see something that's, say, small, say, smaller than an atom, say, maybe a cork, this is not the case. You see, the particle of light that we use to see, usually, is quite literally too big. It just passes straight through them. So nothing bounces back, and you don't see anything. How do we fix this so we can you know, see something? We do it by firing particles of higher energy. They're smaller. They go faster. They hit it. Except there's a problem in it. When it hits it, it changes it. So we don't know what it actually looks like. This is incredibly important, and it's part of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and is one of the fundamental reasons in quantum physics why nearly everything is theoretical. However, with the accumulation of many theories, scientists have put them together to form one of the most generally accepted models of quantum physics, the standard model. The standard model has many important parts in it. However, there are flaws in it that have to still be addressed to this day. And one of these flaws is inside one of the most important parts of it, fundamental forces. When we think of fundamental forces, we think of gravity, maybe some electricity, but simply, in their simplest form, fundamental forces are information. And in order to affect something, they have to transfer that information. And they need something to carry that information. So every force has something that's called a force carrier, and every force is theorized to have one. For example, we're going to use the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force affects the attraction between quarks and other things. So, for example, we have quark number one and quark number two. They both affect each other through the strong nuclear force. However, in order to do that, they have the gluon, which goes between them and transfers the information of the force and basically tells them, hey, you're supposed to be doing this. And every force has this. There are different names. For example, the weak nuclear force, it's the boson, the electromagnetic force, the photon, and theoretically, the gravitational force, the graviton. Each of these forces have calculations inside the standard model to simulate, to allow scientists to simulate different things that could happen inside our universe, except for one, gravity. Gravity is a force much unlike the others. Einstein theorized inside general relativity that it was a force intertwined within space and time. The problem with gravity, although it has multiple problems, one of the problems is the medium that it uses to transfer its information. The medium that it uses to transfer its information is quite literally the fabric of space. And that's a problem because the graviton has to travel through that in order to transfer its information. So scientists said, hey, we're going to look for it. And well, you know, they didn't find it. They didn't find a single particle with the properties needed for a graviton. And that's a problem because if they don't know if it exists, they don't know if there's properties that need to be fixed. And that means it has no calculations inside the standard model to simulate things. So how do we fix this? We could spend a lot of time it's like searching a needle in a haystack the size of a continent for the graviton. However, that would take a long time. So we try to fix this by doing a different thing by creating an entirely different model of quantum physics. This model was called string theory. String theory was first proposed in 1974 by two, these two lovely scientists named Joel Schirk and John Schwartz, and yes, that's how you say it. They theorized that as the low particles in space, not as little one-dimensional points, but rather as a length of string with no thickness. This string was said to exist in two forms, 
open, in which both ends of the string don't touch, and close, in which the ends of the string do touch, forming a ring. What's important about the ring, however, is that they theorize that the ring would have the exact particle properties of the graviton, so they could find it. However, now scientists need to decide, hey, how long are these strings? And let's just say they're small. How small are they? There's actually a length associated with quantum gravity. It's called the Planck length. And since it's associated with gravity, they decide, hey, let's make that the string length. And the calculations worked out. How long is the Planck length, you may be asking? Here is the diameter of a single hydrogen atom. Pretty small. One meter times 10 to the negative 10th. A single neutron is even smaller. One meter times 1.7 meters times 10 to the negative 15th. However, the Planck length is even smaller. 1.6 meters times 10 to the negative 35th. That's quite literally trillions of trillions of times smaller than a neutron and even with these particles of higher energy, we would never be able to find it or look at it. Now, there's a problem with this, though. You might be saying, hey, these strings represent forces that affect areas larger than the string length. How do they work? And I believe that this is adequately explained by a quote from Paul Ho, which states, it follows that for distances much longer than the string length, although still very small, we can approximate string theory by a particle theory only involving particles of the lowest mass in the string spectrum. It is with this that contact that root is made with theories we know. For example, the effective theory of a closed string is a version of general relativity modified by the presence of some extra fields. One more thing. The closed string represents the graviton, However, there are still three other forces that the open string has to represent. The strings are all the same. So how do they represent three entirely different forces? This is described in string theory as different vibrations on the string. So say the weak nuclear force will have a lower vibration than say a strong nuclear force. Now, why hasn't this been accepted yet? There is a problem. String theory requires more dimensions than we currently know. The version of string theory that was created by those two scientists, it's called superstring theory because it uses supersymmetry. This version of string theory, there are more, requires 10 different dimensions. And if we can count, one, two, three, oh no, we're missing seven. Other versions of string theory require even more. So scientists can't simulate things in our universe using string theory because we don't have those 10 dimensions. So if string theory didn't solve the problem of gravity in, part, in quantum physics, how do we use it then? Because quantum gravity is an entirely unknown concept in quantum physics. Before Einstein created general relativity, scientists were still using the Newtonian model of gravity. However, people realized that when they applied this model to very small or very large levels, there were lots of holes inside of it, like a lot of holes. So they decided, hey, we need something new. That's where Einstein created general relativity. General relativity, if you don't know, is a geometrical model of gravity that is still in use by physicists today, which is quite amazing seeing as it was made nearly 100 years ago before even World War II started. There were many important things inside of general relativity. For example, it was able to describe the interaction of gravity at very small levels, something that the Newtonian model was never able to do. However, one of the things inside of it, as I mentioned previously, was that it was intertwined within space and time. Part of this has been actually experimentally proven through the separation of clocks on the surface of Earth and in space. Now, 
Why does any of this matter? The thing is, the reason why the standard model still works, even without gravity inside of it, is because the force of gravity that the particles produce at those small, tiny levels is so small, it barely makes a dent if you just remove the effect of gravity completely. However, that's a problem because if you want to simulate strong forces of gravity upon those small particles, you will be unable to do that using the standard model. So what physicists have done is they first apply the standard model to all the small interactions. And then they use general relativity's gravity and to apply it to the huge forces of gravity. For example, the core of our star. Our star is very heavy, and the force of gravity it produces allows it, atoms inside of it to fuse together, creating heavier elements while releasing massive amounts of energy. Research put in understanding this could lead to fantastical inventions like a fusion reactor. And this leads me on to my final point of today, how this affects us in our daily lives. When we think of quantum physics, we often think of its bizarre mathematical theories, but we rarely ever think of the physical inventions and the technological advancements that it has furthered. For example, take your phone. The entirety of the computing inside of it fully relies on the wave-like nature of the electron in order to transfer power and information throughout the phone. Lasers, which are used in things like CD readers to laser cutters, reply, rely on the unique interaction between the photon and atoms. GPS, which is used by people around the world to navigate, fully depends on the fact that the speed of light is constant, and by timing it, we can triangulate someone's position exactly. Quantum physics isn't an entirely theoretical concept that will only help us understand things at a small level that will never affect us. Quantum physics also isn't something that can only be understood by, say, the smartest people in the world. Quantum physics is the future of mankind. Thank you.